Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Front Row Lecture. My name is Jamie Williamson. I'll be your host today, and I'm really pleased to uh, introduce our speaker featured this week, which is uh, Professor Andrew Sue. So Andrew is actually one of our faculty members who started out here at Scripps as a graduate student. So he got his PhD in 2002, and then he joined the GNF uh, Novartis Institute right across the road from Scripps, at, right out of grad school to be a group leader there. And he was there for nine years uh, as uh, the group leader in bioinformatics. And he joined our faculty at Scripps in 2011, and he became full professor in uh, 2016. So Andrew is an expert in building tools to help organize biomedical information. So some people might call this data mining. Um, he is, uh, you know, he, he, he likes to try to organize the information that's available in ways uh, that link up relationships between drugs, genetics, and disease information. I would say it's safe to say that Andrew specializes in finding things that we didn't know that we knew by pouring through data and making interesting connections. So he, he has a way of engaging the general populace in, in this endeavor and, and as well as their computers. And, and he does this to accomplish some very large tasks. So he has a really unique approach, uh, which is crowdsourcing uh, for the purpose of bioinformatics or biomedical information. And uh, I think you're gonna enjoy today's presentation. We have some innovations. There'll be a little bit of audience participation. So, uh, so well, welcome to Front Row, and it's really my pleasure to introduce, introduce Andrew. So Andrew, take it away. Fantastic, thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about uh, citizen science and how citizen science can be used to help solve biomedical challenges. Uh, I want to start this talk by just acknowledging some of the key people that have been uh, so instrumental in this work. Uh, Ginger Cheng, who uh, led the, the Mark to Cure project, which I'll describe a little bit later. Uh, Benjamin Good, who is a former faculty member here, uh, was informative in sort of the, the many of the high level discussions around crowdsourcing and citizen science that resulted uh, that I'll tell you about today. Uh, Max Nannis and Jennifer Fouquier were the primary developers of the Mark to Cure application. Uh, I, I have a real pleasure to work with uh, a list of uh, many lab members who are involved in other projects, graduate students, postdocs, staff members, uh, many of which are co-supervised with Chun Li Wu, another faculty member here uh, with whom I work uh, very closely. Uh, also very grateful to the NIH for supporting this and other projects. So I actually want to start out with one of those innovations that J Jamie alluded to, and I want to utilize the, the Zoom polling feature here. And the first question is a very simple one. Is doing biomedical research part of your day job? So we'll go ahead and launch that poll. And just please click yes or no. We'll give people a few seconds to answer that. Okay, and then we will close it down. And let's see. Uh, and I cannot see the results of, uh, I forget, Virginia, if you could make me a co-host, that'd be great. Um, and um, the answer to this is not so important. We're gonna circle back to it in a little bit, so no problem. Okay, so, so Scripps is a great place to do biomedical research, but I'm actually gonna start this talk in a different area of science, uh, and that specifically uh, is astronomy. So this is galaxy M51, uh, a spiral galaxy about 31 million light years away. And it was taken, this image was taken as part of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, an effort to systematically catalog many of the objects in our universe. And in 2007, there was a graduate student named Kevin Shawinsky at Oxford, and he had a hypothesis about galaxies, specifically the shape of galaxies and how they related to the wavelengths of light that were coming off from those galaxies. Now, in order to test that hypothesis, he first needed a large data set. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey was perfect for that, so great. 
But the second challenge was that uh, the descriptions and the classifications of the shape of the galaxies, specifically whether they were more spiral-like, whether they were more elliptical, that needed to be done by hand. The image analysis algorithms at, at the moment were, um, were not good enough for, uh, for this particular classification. So as a young graduate student, he rolled up his sleeves, he spent seven 12-hour sessions just classifying galaxies according to those the shape descriptions that he needed. And after those seven 12 hour sessions, he had he completed 50,000 classifications, which is no short of, uh, no short of a, a heroic effort. The challenge was that there were almost a million such images of galaxies in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So with that challenge in front of him, he actually, uh, he and his colleague, Chris Lintot, uh, turned to a different route. They cre actually created a website called Galaxy Zoo, where they put these images up on the internet and invited anybody to come and um, classify galaxies. And uh, according to this simple guide on the right-hand side. And the, re the response was, was, was um, nothing short of amazing. Uh, as they reported, within 24 hours of launch, they had almost 70,000 classifications every hour. By the end of it, they had 50 million classifications contributed by more than 150,000 people. Uh, the Galaxy Zoo folks then generalized this platform to something they called Zooniverse, uh, where they host many citizen science projects, uh, many of which are focused on astronomy, some now branching out to other domain areas. And Zooniverse actually has 1.7 million people signed up to contribute to their various projects. It's contributed to more than 300 scientific publications. So this was in 2007, 2008. Uh, biomedical research actually wasn't far behind. Uh, in May of 2008, Foldit was released. Foldit is a game focused on the challenge of protein folding. So that is to say, when you made a hydrogen bond, a key factor in protein folding, you got points. When you buried hydrophobic residues, you got points. When you made alpha helices and beta sheets, you get points. And this was a very effective way to crowdsource all sorts of uh, very interesting findings in the field of protein folding and structure determination. Foldit has more than 830,000 registered users. Um, in 2010, uh, the RNA folding equivalent was released. This is Eterna. Uh, Eterna has over 250,000 registered users now. Philo, Philo is a game focused on sequence alignment. Uh, again, uh, a task that um, is very important in biomedical research. Launched in 2010, they estimate they have also over 300,000 contributors. And finally, uh, iWire. iWire came out in 2012. Uh, this is an effort to build these intricate and beautiful 3D structures of neurons from 2D electron micrograph, uh, micrographs. Uh, iWire has also over 300,000 registered users. So all of these examples fall into the category of citizen science. And so what is citizen science? Uh, citizen science is really the principle that if we as professional scientists can deconstruct a big scientific challenge into manageable pieces. And if we can give manageable pieces out in engaging and in interesting ways, then there are large communities of individuals who would come and donate their time and donate their effort just for the privilege of being involved in scientific research. So that's a very powerful platform that I think science is really uh, learning to, to utilize. Now, of all the citizen science projects I've described so far, there's one common theme. And that common theme is that they leverage the human visual system. Uh, these are all pattern recognition tasks or involve spatial reasoning. And that makes a lot of sense because human visual abilities are one, nearly universal, and two, humans do it better than computers, right? So those are the two criteria that really make for a good citizen science task. But when we thought about this challenge, there's another skill that we thought satisfied those two criteria that would make for good citizen science. And that is the human ability to understand language. So language is something that we acquire when we're very young. It's something we're able to do at a high level for many decades. 
So why is language important in the context of uh, scientific research? Well, language is sort of the primary mechanism by which we disseminate and share information. Okay, so this is a graph uh, around PubMed. PubMed is the primary database for the biomedical literature. And it shows that that biomedical literature is growing at a rapid rate. In 1985, there were about 300,000 new scientific articles indexed in PubMed. In 2019, that had grown to almost 1.4 million new articles just in one year. On average, that corresponds to one new article every 22 seconds. So what does this say? It says that biomedical research is incredibly productive. There's a lot of new information and new knowledge that's being generated. And that's fantastic because we think about uh, research as an iterative process, right? We take all the knowledge that we have now, we form new hypotheses based on that knowledge, we design experiments to test those hypotheses, and then that feeds back into our current state of knowledge. The challenge is that no single scientist is reading any substantial fraction of that 1.4 million new articles published every year. And so in practice, right, hypotheses are based on the subset of information that each individual scientist has access to. Uh, and that it leads to inefficiencies in science. It would be much more ideal if somehow every hypothesis could be based on the sum total of all knowledge that was available. So clearly, how we manage knowledge is a huge challenge in biomedical research. Okay, so how does citizen science play into all this, right? Many of you don't have biomedical backgrounds, and even if you did, there's not a way where we could all connect up our brains so I could take advantage of what you had read and you could take and, and vice versa, right? That doesn't exist. And so how does citizen science play into this? Well, I wanna show this actually by example. And so this is the part of the talk where I put my faith in you, the audience. Um, so we're going to run a little demo, live demo during this talk. And here are the basic parameters. So first, I want you to participate only if your day job does not include biomedical research. Uh, this relates to the first poll question that we had. So I think there were uh, at least several hundred of you uh, uh, listening today who don't have a background in biomedical research. Uh, the way this is going to work, we're going to read a bit of text together, and then we're going to launch another Zoom poll that will ask you a series of questions about that text. Uh, I want you to answer that text, uh, answer those questions based only on what the text says, uh, not based off of, you know, looking in Wikipedia or Googling, not based off of what you think might or might not be true, just based on what the text says. And finally, don't worry too much about being sure of yourself. Uh, uh, if you don't have a biomedical background, uh, the, the, uh, it'll be challenging, but just make your best guess within the time we have allotted. Okay, so those are the general parameters. Um, we are going to um, look at this particular article from Leukemia Research. It was published in 2014. Uh, specifically, we're going to look right at the abstract section, which is the one paragraph summary of the key findings. And I'm even gonna pull out a few sentence excerpt out of that abstract. Now, before we read this, I actually wanna highlight a few of the key repeated concepts in the abstract, in the paper, and in these sentences. So first, uh, there is this uh, concept, familial systemic mastocytosis. Uh, there is kit, and there is imatinib. Okay, so these are three words and concepts that come up multiple times. What we're gonna do is for each one of these entities, you're going to help me classify them by what type of entity they are. Are they a gene or a protein? Are they a drug or a chemical? Are they a disease? Or are they something else? And we're gonna do that again through a Zoom poll, okay? I wanna emphasize that you aren't being expected to understand exactly what the text is saying. Your goal is to just figure out what types of concepts these are and make your best guess, okay? With that as context, Let's get started and we will launch. Oh, I'm sorry, we're gonna read this uh, sentence, uh, this excerpt together. So, we report a case of system, uh, familial systemic mastocytosis with the rare kit K509I germline mutation. 
in vitro treatment with imatinib, dasatinib, and PKC-412 reduce cell viability of primary mast cells harboring KIT K509I mutation. Both patients with familial systemic mastocytosis had remarkable hematological and skin improvement after three months of imatinib treatment. Okay, so there is the task in front of you, um, and we're going to launch the poll. Um, and let's give you about 30 seconds to complete this poll so that you have an audio cue of about when that is. We will. Great, fantastic. So we will go ahead and wrap up that poll. And uh, let's share those results out while we look at uh, the essentially the right answers, okay? So uh, familial systemic mastocytosis uh, is actually a disease. And that is something that 94% uh, of you uh, got correct. <clears throat> uh, KIT is actually a gene or a protein something that 87% of you got correct. And imatinib is actually a drug or a chemical and 94% of you got that correct. So uh, congratulations, uh, you did a great job. Um, and um, uh, right, so uh, despite being that, I think mostly a word salad to, uh, to, to many of you, I think you were able to use uh, the cues to, to, to get those uh, concept types correct. Um, so I, I have to confess that computers actually aren't that bad at the step that you just did. Uh, computers actually struggle a little bit more with the next step that we're going to uh, go, and that is uh, we're going to we're going to pursue, and that is actually defining the relationships between these various concepts. So we've already decided that KIT is a gene or a protein, and that familial systemic mastocytosis is a disease. So there are only so many ways that genes and proteins can be related to diseases. So for example, uh, there could be altered gene expression of the gene or protein that causes the disease. Mutation of the gene could cause the disease. Uh, the gene or protein could be a biomarker of the disease, or there could be no relation. These two things could just simply be mentioned in the text without no relation, with no relation to them. Um, in addition, the second example that we'll pull out um, is imatinib to familial systemic mastocytosis. So there are only so many ways that drugs can be related to diseases. Drugs might treat the disease, they might cause or exacerbate the disease, they might increase the risk of the disease, prevent the disease, or again, there might be no relation. Okay, so the next task is a zoom poll to essentially characterize the, uh, the nature of these relationships. So uh, we'll go ahead and launch that poll now. And again, about 30 seconds. All right, fantastic. We'll go ahead and end that poll and share the results back out with everybody. So this is a little, uh, what we call a network diagram uh, of the results. Um, so um, every one of those concepts now I've drawn as a box and we call that a node. And then those boxes are joined by edges, which uh, define the relationship between those edges. So first, uh, we asked you how is KIT related to familial systemic mastocytosis? 
And uh, the most common answer given by 55% of you is mutation causes. And that in fact is the correct answer. Um, and secondly, uh, how does a matinib relate to familial systemic mastocytosis? And 87 of you correctly identified that a matinib treats familial systemic mastocytosis. So again, uh, great job, everybody. Um, you essentially got the right answers. And it underscores the idea that even if you don't have uh, the, con uh, the, the, the context to understand the significance of those results, constructing this mini graph is something that citizen scientists, people without formal training in biomedical research, can absolutely do. So if th this is uh, um, just those based off of those two questions we looked at, if we were to continue, uh, continue to flesh out the uh, relationships in that particular abstract, we would form this little mini graph that talks about how more of the concepts are related to each other. And again, we call this sort of an, a knowledge graph. Uh, and that will be useful in ways that I'll describe in a second. Um, but again, I want to understand the, underscore the point that I haven't taught you anything, right? I haven't made you understand what this article is trying to say, uh, but you leveraged your human abilities to infer context and to parse language and to make educated guesses. And the underlying assertion is that if citizen scientists can help us accurately do that from papers, well, that could be a really valuable resource for biomedical research, okay? So let's dive into that last point a little bit more. How would these knowledge graphs actually be useful for research? Well, to test that and to explore that, we actually created a website uh, uh, called Mark to Cure, focused around a particular rare disease called NGLY1 deficiency. So this is an ultra rare disease, uh, probably fewer than 100 uh, kids in the world have been diagnosed with this disease. Uh, the first one diagnosed is uh, shown here, uh, Bertrand Mite, shown in the upper right, and his father, Matt Mite. Um, and um, their story is fantastically interesting to read, uh, so I urge you to look it up if you're interested. But uh, NGLY1 deficiency is a disease for which there is no treatment, right? And so the question was, if we could build a knowledge graph around NGLY1 and NGLY1 deficiency, would we be able to identify potential research directions and even in a best case scenario, potential uh, treatments that could be, um, uh, that could be tried? Um, so to cut a, long, uh, a lot of work short, I'm gonna show you sort of the, the end network that results, resulted from our effort. So we gave <clears throat> our citizen science crowd a set of 3,200 documents. These are documents or abstracts that were directly related to NGLY1 and NGLY1 deficiency and, is all, and in addition, indirectly uh, related. <clears throat> What's shown in green are the genes and proteins. Blue uh, uh, text is for diseases and symptoms. And pink has treatments and drugs, okay? And edges here represent a co-occurrence meaning they co-occurred at a certain frequency within those abstract. We actually didn't do the explicit relationship extraction that we just demoed uh, previously. But nevertheless, uh, I think it gives you a flavor of the type of rich knowledge graph that can result in analyzing uh, uh, sets of the literature. I'm in particular gonna highlight uh, the, the, the two nodes in, uh, that are uh, with arrows. So the red arrow points to NGLY1, that is the gene that is mutated uh, in NGLY1 deficiency uh, in that disease. Uh, over my shoulder here is ACTH, which is adrenocorticotropin hormone. And uh, what's interesting is that ACTH was actually pre previously suggested and tried as a treatment for NGLY1 deficiency. Uh, and it actually had a really fantastic improvement on Bertrand's uh, symptoms. Uh, unfortunately, it had to be discontinued due to side effects and toxicity, um, but um, nevertheless, the fact that we were able to retrospectively identify a potential treatment gave us a little bit of confidence. So I'm, I'm definitely not um, going to overhype the results uh, that we produced here. Um, Mark Cure was 
mostly a pilot experiment to understand how citizen scientists could help us contribute to building a knowledge graph uh, at scale. We certainly haven't reached Galaxy Zoo levels of participation, and we are a long way from finding new and novel treatments for rare diseases like NGLI1 deficiency. Uh, a lot of this ties into uh, ongoing work now that we have trying to, to tweak this model, both in terms of how the interface looks and how we secure funding for this type of project. But what I will take a moment, uh, a second to, to, to rave about is actually the community of contributors that we had. Uh, we asked uh, many of our contributors, why do you mark to cure? Why do you participate? And uh, uh, me and our team were, were very inspired by the, the, the answers we got back that ranged from uh, educational motivations to altruistic motivations to personal connections with disease. Um, this is from a little meetup we had with our local San Diego community. And um, again, just a, a, a fantastically generous uh, community that uh, was interested in moving research forward and helping others. Okay, so let's come back to this network. This is based off of a data set of 3,200 documents. But what if we could do this for all one and a half million new articles that are published every year, uh, for all 30 million articles that are uh, indexed in PubMed? Uh, the goal would be to create this rich network um, of biomedical knowledge. And the goal would be to make that comprehensive, covering all of the biomedical literature. We'd make it current, so that as new literature is produced, we in roughly real time would be able to add it to the knowledge graph. And it's computable. And what does computable mean? Well, right now, when we access the literature, Primarily, we do that by keyword searches, right? We search for keywords, but it doesn't query what actually is being asserted, what the key findings are. Um, and so we just then, it's sort of like a pointer to relevant uh, literature articles. But a knowledge network like this, a biomedical knowledge network here that Scott describes the key concepts and the relationships between the key concepts are absolutely something that uh, we can put in a database and query in terms of for example, uh, give me all genes related to this disease. Give me all drugs that target a given protein. These are the types of queries into the biomedical literature uh, and the sum total of existing knowledge that would greatly improve the efficiency of research. On top of that, a network like this, I believe, would be really useful for artificial intelligence or AI. Uh, and we've seen an explosion in AI in recent, um, in recent years. Uh, but let me dive into this a little bit more. How might AI on this type of knowledge network be used? One application would be in the area of drug repurposing. So simply stated, drug repurposing is identifying or developing new uses for existing drugs. Uh, there's been actually, uh, this is one of the, the strengths of, of Scripps Research, and there's been a previous front row lecture series from Arnab Chatterjee uh, talking about some of our drug repurposing efforts. Urge you to go watch that if, you, uh, if you're interested. Uh, but this idea of finding new uses for existing drugs is something that I think is uh, very uh, um, approachable from a knowledge network point of view. So how would that work? Again, imagine we have this massive network with millions of nodes and edges. If we pulled out all the drugs um, in, in that network to one side, and then to the other side, we pulled out all the diseases. And in the middle, what we would have is all of the rest of the network, where you have all the genes, the proteins, the pathways, the genetic variants, the metabolites, all the other concepts and interesting parts of biology in the middle that connect the drugs and diseases. Well, what we do then do is we actually look at real uh, drugs and the real diseases that they treat, right? And we look in between within this network in the middle to try to find patterns that are preserved in common between known drugs and the diseases that they treat. And artificial intelligence is very good at finding those patterns, so the recurring patterns. Once you train your AI model, right, you learn the features that are in common between the real cases, then it gives you the power to look at unknown cases. 
So suppose we have a new disease that we're interested in. That could be uh, NGLY1 deficiency. It could be COVID-19. It could be uh, diabetes, right? The way we then approach this from a repurposing standpoint in knowledge networks is that we anchor that disease into this network that we have. We want to find the genes, proteins, pathways, and so on related to that disease. And from there, the artificial intelligence model can be used to make predictions, to make classifications on which ones of these existing drugs actually could be used in treatment of that disease. So this is at a high level what, how we think drug repurposing could work um, in, uh, on these knowledge networks. I have to tell you that some of the smartest minds in AI are thinking about this problem, about how to make predictions on knowledge networks. But they're actually not thinking about this from the standpoint of biomedical knowledge graphs. Uh, they're thinking about it from the perspective of selling you stuff, right? So if you think about the knowledge graphs that the big tech companies are uh, assembling, right? Uh, instead of drugs, they think about people, right? And uh, high tech is great about, very efficient about harvesting and organizing all the data about us, our friends, our coworkers, the websites we visit, the apps we, uh, we install, the, the movies we like, so on and so forth. And also the products that we buy. So if we, uh, they have access to this rich network of information, and of course their goal is to find new products that we might want. So why is high tech thinking about these AI algorithms? Well, it's because the financial incentives are so strong, right? Online advertising accounts for hundreds of billions of dollars of, uh, of the economy. Uh, online commerce in general is, is several fold larger than that even. And so, um, you know, Microsoft even put this in, a, in, a, in the most transparent and plain terms um, in one of their papers talking about the machine learning that they're doing. And they said that even 0.1% of accuracy improvement would yield greater earnings in the hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So it really underscores that, um, again, this is why many of the brightest minds in AI are working in the high-tech field. But I think our underlying hypothesis and our vision for this is that if we had a biomedical network, if we had all the knowledge about biomedical information organized as well as high-tech has organized all our information about us, then that would spur people to think about how AI could be used in the context of biomedical research. And I think it would also lead to an influx of talent uh, who was interested in spending their talents and energy on something perhaps more substantial than optimizing ad click rates uh, to fractions of 1%. Incidentally, if any of that describes you, please get in touch, we're hiring. Um, but I will leave you with uh, this thought here, that uh, science is a team sport and citizen science is a great way of engaging a larger team, right? It's a way of encouraging and enabling anybody who's interested to really participate in research at a number of different levels. Uh, Mark to Cure, our citizen science initiative, our primary one to date, um, is on hiatus while we're reorganizing and, and, and figuring out next steps. But I did want to leave you with a, a, a page of several links that um, where if you are interested in engaging research, these are great places to start. Uh, the slides will be shared afterwards and um, so you'll have access to those links as well. The last thing I want to do is uh, just mention uh, this upcoming uh, front row lecture series, October 14th by Michael Erb, who's a fantastic assistant professor in our department of chemistry. Uh, really looking forward to that talk. Um, and with that, I'm happy to um, take questions. All right, thanks, Andrew. That was, that was a terrific and engaging uh, presentation. Uh, so I encourage anyone who has questions, just uh, continue to, to type in. I thought maybe I would um, ask a couple myself and maybe we could have a little discussion. Uh, so, so one of the things that you illustrated in your poll is that, so not everybody got everything right, 
but we had a couple hundred people answer the question. And so you get consensus. And, and you know, I noticed one question had, uh, you know, a low, it was 55%, and the other question was 87%. So how do you use that kind of information in, in building this knowledge graph? It's in, in a way, it's how sure is the audience of the relationship? Uh, it's a great question because that is a real signal that you can imagine leveraging. It's interesting because when we think about um, organizing knowledge, this is sort of the field of curation. So there's a whole field of biocuration where we have PhD level scientists um, establishing these links. And when they do that, you know, it becomes um, uh, carved in stone as sort of this binary thing. This is true and this is not true, right? Um, and we lose all shades of gray. And I think citizen science is, uh, and, and sort of large scale crowdsourcing where we have lots of redundancy is one way we start to bring back those shades of gray. Because I think you're right, when we think about AI, that is real signal that we could use to learn, um, uh, that we could use to learn on. Uh, Andrew, while, while we're talking, a, a couple of people have asked, could you put the links up um, just share your slide again. So while, while we're talking, maybe people could jot some things down. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, maybe let me follow up on that, that question. And you know what, so it must not work all the time. So do you have any examples or what are the modes of failure and when, and how, and how do you detect when there's a problem with, you know, what, what the crowd is, is coming up with? So, the modes of failure, the primary mode of failure is actually uh, not distilling down the problem enough to, um, in a way that makes it accessible and um, makes it engaging for users, um, right? There, there's always this, this mindset of, uh, with crowdsourcing in general and citizen science, that if you build it, they will come. Well, you know, I think we do have to think about, you know, making sure that citizen scientists and contributors feel um, uh, have motivations, right? Either we are feeding back some educational component. Do they feel like they're learning something? Do we feed back access to uh, the scientists where they can you know, start to interact with professional scientists? Um, I think that's the biggest uh, place where um, citizen science uh, becomes difficult. And, and I'll, I'll also say that because that type of research in terms of, it's actually a social science research, right? It's sort of how do you engage people in a deep and sustainable level? And that's something that we as biomedical scientists actually don't think about. So that's been our sharpest learning curve. So, um, so I, have a, I have a question from um, M. Shepard here. This is, it. I, I like this question because I actually asked you the same question probably about six years ago at a seminar you gave on campus. So, so basically the question is, you're, you're, you have to go do all of this. Why shouldn't the people who actually write the papers be required to generate the knowledge graph of their paper as part of the publication? It's a great question. And it, uh, we, we could have a whole nother seminar on that, uh, sort of incentives and innovations in scientific publishing. Yep. Uh, and let me, let me just try to summarize some of the key factors here. One is that um, scientific publishers aren't necessarily motivated to innovate in this area, right? So imagine, you know, as a condition of publication, oh, you know, here's a giant form that we need you to uh, fill out, right? Um, authors who are already strapped for time um, are, uh, may balk at that and may say, oh, I don't want to deal with that. I'm going to go to another journal, right? And so we have to build in the incentives where scientists want to do that, or at very least are mandated to by, for example, funding bodies to make sure that the science that funding bodies are funding gets used in the maximally productive way. Um, but on top of that, right, we also want to make sure we have the interfaces so people can enter that information easily, right? It's, it's, it's not going to work if, if essentially it's an Excel sheet that, that goes on forever and there are no great tools to allow people to construct these knowledge graphs. Those tools are coming online. Yep. And then the last piece I'll mention is that, you know, 
authors definitely have the most domain knowledge about what they are reporting in the paper. But it really is a partnership between people who understand data structure and how to represent data in a way that it can be maximally reused. And those partnerships are also just now still uh, are, are still being developed. Uh, now you touched you touched on something um, uh, in, in your article about or in your talk about um, artificial intelligence. So you say the goal of that is to make predictions from complex sets of information. But the way you described it was that that even AI needs structured input. So so it needs the knowledge base or the knowledge graphs that you're building. And those aren't widely available. So, so we have a question from, from Paul Shackner, who's asking about what Watson's IBM uh, has done, or IBM's Watson has done um, to analyze the biomedical literature. And maybe, you know, what's, what's missing from its ability to, to do well at that particular task? Um, so uh, it, it's, it's a great question and, it, and it's, uh, it's um, yeah, so it, it hits it right at the heart of the, uh, the issue. So uh, I'll say a few things. So first, uh, as you pointed out, uh, Jamie, in that intro, right, um, the AI uh, is, is not great. It needs, it needs a starting point, right? It often needs labeled data. So it needs, if you're going to learn patterns about the relationships between drugs and diseases, well, you need to know what drugs treat what disease, right? You, you, otherwise, there's nothing to train on. So humans, um, adding humans in the loop, humans have always been in the loop in terms of generating those training data. What's really exciting and interesting to us now is essentially what, what we've all referred to as active learning, right? So having a tighter feedback loop between machine learning and uh, the people who are doing the curation. Um, to the point where actually, you know, in, in essence, you're, there are machine learning approaches. So machine learning can say, here are the most valuable bits of information I need to improve myself. And those get sent to humans. And so that the work that the humans do is maximally useful to the, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the algorithm. Um, last thing I'll say is with regards to sort of, um, uh, you know, many high profile, uh, uh, AI based uh, algorithms like Watson, right? I mean, it's a really hard problem. And I think it's safe to say uh, with Watson in particular, the marketing might have gotten a little out ahead of the science there. And, and I think it underscores sort of the challenge that this um, that really exists uh, in our field. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question from Richie Gibson. And, and, and I'm guessing he might be an attorney. He says, you may be interested in how legal literature information is organized in Westlaw and Lexis. Is, so is there any kind of, you know, comparison that you can do uh, between biomedical literature and, and legal uh, work? Boy, it's, uh, that, that's a great question in terms of, you know, thinking about how these approaches relates to other areas. Um, you know, I, I, I would say that uh, the same basic principles, right? Th this this field of information extraction uh, out of free text, right, boils down to, again, identifying the concepts and identifying the relationships between those concepts. And, and that is a field of computer science, information extraction and natural language processing um, that is domain agnostic. So much of the, uh, um, uh, and sort of knowledge graph reasoning as well, sort of how we, uh, make predictions on knowledge graph, right? Most of the time we're operating on uh, things like, you know, who is a spouse of whom and, and things like that, very general purpose data. But the intent is always to apply those to all sorts of very specific domain expertise. Um, I, I, I happen to think, you know, from a citizen science perspective, uh, biomedical research is more engaging, perhaps, than, than law, but, but of course, you know, there's a lot of people in this world who probably feel differently. Right. Uh, we have another question I, that I know you've uh, thought about, but um, and that's, what about compensation and Mechanical Turk? What if you've just paid people cents to, uh, to do this? Does that yeah. 
we'll broaden the scope. What's the over under analysis on that? Yeah. Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk is a system where you can essentially pay people to do small micro tasks, so to speak. Um, and um, and it is, uh, we actually used AMT in a lot of our prototyping in terms of understanding for a citizen science perspective, you know, what uh, people are capable of, how much training we need to do for people. Um, but I would say even, you know, at the scale of literature, you know, yes, we could probably tackle a significant portion of that through, um, through AMT and, and micro payments like that. Uh, there are ethical issues in terms of how, you know, whether or not we want to essentially undercut the, the, the professional uh, curators. Um, and I, I will say also that the micro payments, even though they are micro, they do skew the incentives, right? So I think it's clear from, you know, um, uh, initiatives like a Galaxy Zoo that it is perfectly reasonable to ask people to contribute just for the sake of contributing without having that sort of introducing that bias um, uh, of the financial aspect. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to aggregate a few people's question and ask um, just generally, so how do you know that this has been done right? You got all these non-experts uh, come up, coming up with something. And, and so what's to prevent you from getting into a situation of garbage in, garbage out? Yeah, uh, a great question, right? And this is a critical thing in terms of how we evaluate our own effort, right? So we do need to start with ground truth. We need to start with, so, so um, the part before Mark to Cure that I skipped over um, was uh, exactly that, where we knew the right answer and we had to ask the crowd whether they could reproduce uh, reproduce that right answer. And the again, I'm going to summarize a lot of work to say that uh, an individual citizen scientist, uh, when you compare that to a professional scientist, obviously that, that non-trained scientist does a little worse. But when you aggregate the results over here for the particular evaluation case we were looking at was, was disease recognition, once you got to six people with no formal training, their majority rules vote was about equivalent to uh, what a professional curator was able to do. And again, it underscores to the very first point you uh, brought in, uh, Jamie, is that even among professional curators, there's no perfection, right? So we have to account for there being some uh, uh, scientific and or language ambiguity in what those curators are doing. And so um, absolutely, we need to start with, um, with uh, with ground truth to develop the systems. And just like we talked about feedback loops between citizen scientists and AI, you also imagine feedback loops between citizen scientists and professional biocurators. Um, and the goal would be to handle the simple stuff within citizen science and push the really high value stuff that requires the PhD but, you know, down to the professional curators or up, depending on perspective. Okay, um, I think uh, I think we've had a pretty good discussion, um, and you know the one th one thing I would just like to to close by saying is that I think I think it's uh, it's important to remember and Andrew is not trying to advise people about treatments of diseases, right? Andrew is doing research in how do we tackle the explosion of information in biomedical problems. That's what he studies, and he's trying to develop tools that lead to uh, you know, a, a improved understanding of the relationships of, amongst all kinds of data. And, and he's doing so in a really innovative and engaging way. So it thanks Andrew for giving us a, a window into your brain and, uh, and, and for a really great presentation. We've had a lot of engagement from the audience. And again, I would remind you that we have Michael Erb on October 14th. And uh, he'll be talking about uh, drug screening uh, for cancer and some other diseases. So uh, thanks again, Andrew. And uh, to those of you around the world listening in, I want you to be well. Take care and see you next time. Bye-bye.